Good evening, everyone. We'll start in about a minute. I still see we have several of our participants logging in. We'll just give them about a minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, great. We'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kip Rogers. I am the Chief Academic Officer in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and I'm happy to present to you Being Safe, Learning Together in the Classroom, which is the third in a five-part series where we talk about VB being safe as we enter the 2020-21 school year. And this evening, we're going to provide you with some additional information on teaching and learning in a virtual environment. We know Many of you have many questions about how next year is going to look, and we certainly look to seek opportunities such as this to provide you with some answers as we continue to decide on the way in which we will open up schools. So today, so today, so today staff from our Department of Teaching and Learning will walk you through the day in the life of what it might look for students next school year. We'll provide you with some sample schedules for the elementary, middle, and high school. We'll share some instructional strategies that will take place in the virtual environment. And we'll also share some instructional technology resources that our students and families will have access to. And then lastly, we will answer some of the questions that were shared with us earlier this week, and we'll answer as many as time permits. And now I'd like to introduce you to some of the team members from the Department of Teaching and Learning who are here with me today to talk about what we have in store for the next school year. We have Mrs. Danielle Colucci, who is our Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at the elementary level. We also have Mr. Matt Delaney, who is our Executive Director of Secondary Teaching and Learning. We have Dr. Ronnie myers Dobb, who is our Executive Director of the Office of Programs for exceptional children, otherwise special education, or support. she works with students with disabilities. We have Dr. Nicole DeVries, which is our, who is our director of K-12 and gifted programs. And then lastly, certainly not least, we have Dr. Sharon Shoebridge, who is our director of instructional technology, who will share some information with you. So we certainly understand that this is not the first time you've heard that we will be beginning school virtually next school year. And students were provided and families were provided with an option, one, which would be to continue their learning next year in the face-to-face -face setting or choosing option two, which is to have 100% of their learning for at least the first semester, 100% virtually. Now, those who chose option number one will continue their learning temporarily virtually until it is safe to return to school. So I did want to point that out and just reiterate that for the group. Also wanted to share, there are some differences between the emergency learning that took place this past spring and the manner in which we will instruct students coming in the fall. And I wanted to point out two biggest differences are one, there will be many more opportunities for students to engage in synchronous or live instruction. They'll have an opportunity to many opportunities to interact with their teachers as well as with their peers. Graded assignments will take place and will do so with feedback. That's a little different than what was held 
for the emergency learning plan. Feedback was provided on student assignments. However, those assignments were not graded. Participation was monitored in the emergency learning plan. Conversely, for the fall 2020 instructional plan, participation will also be monitored and attendance will be counted. With the emergency learning plan, we did respond with our curriculum instruction and pacing by revising it in response to recovery. We were in an emergency situation. We certainly continue that aspect with, continue, with curriculum instruction and assessment, as well as with pacing to make sure that there was an enhanced response to recovery as it relates to learning loss and a strong focus on remediation and acceleration is expected. Additionally, we have some mandatory trainings for our staff and as well as we've identified areas in which we will certainly hold each other accountable as educators to make sure that we are providing the best opportunities for all of our students. I want to touch a little bit on social emotional learning. Now, it's no secret that many of our students have had some trying experiences as well as adults. So we spent quite a bit of an opportunity making sure that we are planning well for our students and our staff when they return to school. The Virginia Beach City Public Schools Strategic Framework and Conference to 2025 does place a strong emphasis on student well-being as well as their social emotional learning. And it does provide a foundation for a safe and positive learning environment in all instructional set settings. The Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, otherwise known as CASEL, is the framework that we use for supporting our students' social and emotional needs via a face-to-face -face and virtual instructional model. The CASEL framework also provides social and emotional learning uh, alignment that we have for our teaching and learning framework and additional strategies to support the SEL development in our students will be provided to all of our students in order to enhance their learning experiences. And we do have a, a team that's working very closely together to make sure that that happens. So I wanna talk a little bit about our provisions by our school counselings. So as we begin the school year, our school counselors certainly will be readily available to provide assistance to our students as well as their families. Not only um, online counseling services will be available as part of our division's comprehensive school counseling program. All across our elementary, middle, and high schools, school counselors will be providing both synchronous and asynchronous lessons to students on a variety of topics to assist them. There'll be tips from getting acclimated in a virtual environment to college application workshops, our school counselors are and will be working to provide many resources for our students and their families. And additionally, our school counselors have been continuing to reach out to our families, even from the spring, to ensure that students have what they need in order to actively engage in learning in the fall. And for our students who need additional supports, our school counselors do plan to collaborate with staff, parents and their guardians in order to coordinate both small group and individual counseling supports for them. From our youngest students through our graduating seniors, our counselors can help students navigate situations and help them to develop coping skills in order to deal with both school and home life stressors, as well as to grow through social and emo emotional wellness training. Our school counselors are proactively reaching out to students during these difficult times in order to help them ensure their safety and well-being. And throughout the school year, you can absolutely expect to receive communications from your school's counseling department about the various resources, programs, and events that Virginia Beach City Public Schools will be providing to address the very diverse needs that are within our community. And we're looking forward to making sure that we provide those supports not only to students, but to our staff as well, because we recognize that we have to take care of the staff who are taking care of the children. So I wanna transition next and talk about what's taking place in our elementary. So I'm gonna ask Mrs. Colucci to begin. Good her. evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. Thanks for joining us. 
we have provided what you see on the screen to provide you a glimpse of an elementary sample schedule. Um, it is a very accurate depiction of what a schedule might look like. Um, it provides um, the instructional windows that you see provided throughout the day. They will align to the instructional minutes that VDOE expects of us. Um, those instructional windows will be the time in which teachers deliver core content instruction, which is math, language, arts, science, and social studies at the elementary level, as well as electives classes, gifted lessons, and any specialized instruction. Um, so that will be um, when students would receive that type of instruction. It could be independent learning, teacher-directed, synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, more specific details of times within the instructional windows that would be provided will come to parents and families from their child's teacher once the teachers return uh, uh, the first week of September for in-service week. As you'll notice, um, we really prioritized recess breaks and physical activity. We're keeping our children at the heart of our planning and ensuring that what we provide is not only healthy for our children, but developmentally appropriate. Um, principals will be providing, uh, some of them have already posted today, but in the next couple of days, you should expect to receive communication from elementary principals on how to access your child's grade level schedule, which will provide you these specific times on when morning meetings, instructional windows, the lunch break, and closing circles will be. Ready for the next slide, I think. So, the instructional windows, I really wanted to provide a little bit more clarity on what that might be because uh, we've received several questions uh, that are quite reasonable. I have three children of my own and I'm just as curious as what exactly the times of their lessons will be this fall. But as you can see here, um, there might be several instructional windows throughout the day and there might be two. Um, there could be up to four or five just depends on how the grade level at your child's school develops that schedule. And that really is because specialized instructional specialists have to access students at different times. Um, and our electives teachers will still be providing instruction like art, PE, and music. And so every grade level um, at the elementary level is not able to have the exact same schedule or we wouldn't be able to provide those great opportunities that our children need. So um, if you look on the left side, you'll see what a teacher might be doing during one of the instructional windows. And on the right column, you'll see what students might be engaging in during an instructional window. So it might start um, the day, uh, the lesson with a modeled uh, direct instruction lesson or an investigation. And the teacher might provide all of the students at once uh, a task that goes along with that lesson. And then she would begin seeing small groups. At the elementary level, we prioritize uh, small group action and we use data uh, to group students together by their specific needs. Uh, some of our students need uh, acceleration. Some of our students need to review con um, some misconceptions they may have and, and we can best meet their needs by differentiating for the learner. And so one might happen in one time period and the other children would be working on an independent task. So I'm ready for the next slide. We really wanted to share how committed Virginia Beach is to ensuring the educational experience we provide within those instructional windows. Um, is meaningful, authentic, um, and developmentally appropriate again. So teachers are engaging in professional learning on best practices for virtual learning. Um, instructional coaches in every building stand ready uh, to support co-planning, co-teaching, modeling, um, to ensure our students are provided a healthy balance of either synchronous, asynchronous, digital, and non-digital ways. Um, to engage in learning. And that's really gonna be very important. And I know that 
may be comforting to a lot of families that might look at a schedule and think, oh my goodness, um, that instructional window is a long time to be on a device. So we really are um, working to ensure that we provide a variety of ways to engage in the content. And as you see on the screen here, uh, we can do that and we will be um, providing various ways to engage in content. Your student might be able to create a physical model. They might be asked to write in a notebook and then take a picture of their writing and send it to their teacher uh, via Schoology message or another method. So there will be a, a nice balance for our little ones uh, to engage in their content that doesn't always require technology. And on the next screen, I know that many parents um, are curious from pre-K through 12 on how their child will be graded and how, how would we assess in a virtual world. And a lot of that professional learning, again, is being provided. Our teachers did an amazing job um, for, formatively assessing learning uh, in marking period four. They were giving specific feedback and providing students a lot of support and learning. Uh, but this um, fall, we will be also assigning grades um, and proficiency scores. And so Virginia Beach really follows a balanced assessment approach. Um, effective lessons are developed using multiple data points, uh, such as assessment data, rubrics, checklists, um, we use student learning styles and interests to design our lesson plans to make sure they're meaningful to our, ki our kids and effective. Uh, all of these data points also help us track student progress and determine a proficiency score or a grade. Um, so on the right side, you'll see the process that all of these various ways we can get data in a virtual or a face-to-face -face setting um, lead us into providing very descriptive feedback all throughout the learning process and giving multiple opportunities for children to show us their understanding and what they've learned. Um, before assigning a grade. Thank you, Mrs. Colucci. So next we're gonna have Mr. Delaney share a little bit about the day in the life of our students who are in secondary, both middle and in high school. And Mr. Delaney. Good evening. As Dr. Rogers said, my name is Matt Delaney. I'm the Executive Director of Secondary uh, Teaching and Learning. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Ms. Colucci shared some balanced instructional experiences and balanced assessment practices that are true across uh, pre-K through 12, but I think it's important from a be safe learning together in the classroom to talk about how the schedule has changed relatively significantly on the secondary level. So Dr. Rogers, if you could please click to the next slide. Sorry. When we start the year virtually on the middle school level and, and on the high school, but we will all be in a four by four instructional model, which is a little bit different than what we've been accustomed to over the years. But we have typically been in what we call an AB block schedule. The purpose for that move to the four by four schedule is, is around that concept of being safe and learning together. Uh, if you've listened to Dr. Spence or other sessions, we talked about the need to go to this schedule so that we could minimize the interactions of students with teachers, minimize the teacher course load, and also minimize the student course load, especially in a virtual environment, having a large amount of seven to eight courses per semester. It could be more challenging. We're in a four by four semester. We, we are gonna be, at a, students are gonna be a maximum of three to four classes per term. So in the middle school virtual schedule that you're seeing here, there is time for a zero bell. Uh, those of you that are familiar with zero bells. This is an opportunity for students in some cases to take an extra elective um, so that they can engage in band or orchestra or something of that nature. There's time that's been in, put in place for SEL and advisory as well as breakfast in the morning. And then you will see where a student will go into his block one class for 75 minutes, block two class for 75 minutes. Lunch break for 60 minutes as Ms. Colucci talked about the ability to get away from the computer to unplug. Uh, to exercise, to engage in some level of uh, secondary recess, for lack of a better way of saying it, is highly encouraged. Then a block three course. Now, to be clear for, for you in these areas, students will have two core classes, which could be, for example, an English and a math class. So block one is English, block two is math, 
and then block three is an elective course, such as PE will use as the example. That student will spend every block one in that math class, and they will spend every block two in that English class, Monday through, or Tuesday through Friday, and every block three in that PE class, Tuesday through Friday. You see at the end of the schedule here, where there's time that's been put aside for literacy and numeracy support and enrichment, we felt it was very important for students to be able to engage in a level of academic support, meet with their teachers on those days. For example, a student may be enrolled in math for the first term, but he is not enrolled in English in the, in the first term. So therefore, we felt it was very important that students that are not in the English class still receive some level of literacy support so that we can address the gaps that may have been uh, created as a result of being out in the spring or provide the enrichment opportunities that are there. Also like to take you to Mondays. As you remember before, Mondays were PL days for professional learning days for teachers. We called them Monday moving days for students in the spring, but the expectations for students on those days is that they're gonna participate in asynchronous learning. There's opportunities for them to get involved in tutoring and interact with teachers on a more consistent basis than they may have done in the spring. We also wanted to, to provide opportunities for activities, club meetings, and so on. In a few moments, I'll go through what a typical day might look like on the secondary level. But again, uh, students will come on the four by four schedule, which means they will have on the middle school level, three blocks of classes and a literacy and numeracy support block. Next slide, please, Dr. Rogers. On the high school schedule, a little bit different than the middle school in terms of the number of blocks that are available to students. Students can take up of a maximum of four classes in the four by four schedule per term. When I use the word term, uh, essentially what that means is what you traditionally know as a semester. So from September to January, they will be in the first term where uh, a high school student will take the same classes every day, four days a week in the virtual environment. Uh, those blocks are scheduled for 75 minutes, but we'll talk a, a little bit in a few moments around what that looks like in terms of actual time in a synchronous setting. At the end of the day in the virtual schedule, there'll be 50 minutes allowed for academic support, tutoring options, options, potential for teachers to hold conferences with students or with families. And we also wanted to make sure they could engage in the club meetings and team meetings as Dr. Rogers talked about earlier. That connection with school is such an important part of the social emotional learning process. And we wanted to ensure that they still maintain those connections with those clubs, teams, and activities that they uh, have taken advantage for, advantage of previously. On the left side as well, you will see the Monday expectations that students can review asynchronous lessons that can complete classwork or makeup work, attend office hours or attend tutoring hours. Early in the, in the near future, I believe next week, schools will be sharing the specific schedules in terms of time, maybe not, not your students' individual schedules, but the general schedules that will be used at all levels of mil, uh, middle and secondary school. Now to try to be a little more clear in terms of sharing what a day in the life in the four by four schedule may look like for a student. Uh, next slide please, Dr. Rogers. Just wanted to outline a few key components. As I shared earlier, students will attend the same three to four classes daily. It's important that they're there to check in at the start of each class with the teacher and peers at the start of every class that they're in. And this will allow them the opportunity to engage in synchronous instruction we are making a recommendation to teachers based on feedback we received from our summer school teachers and other teachers that have had more experience in the, in the synchronous world of virtual learning, that a recommendation of 45 minutes, to, 45 minutes to 60 minutes of synchronous instruction. Again, this provides a great opportunity during the synchronous time for students to interact with their peers, interact with their teachers. Also in that day in the life of the four by four schedule allows the student to view asynchronous lessons and to complete asynchronous assignments. Essentially, when you look at uh, virtual learning, there's three levels of interactions that we encourage uh, teachers to work within with our students. That's providing students an opportunity to interact with their peers, as I shared, also to interact and engage with their teachers, and most importantly, interact and engage in the content. And that in engagement with the content can occur with the asynchronous lessons and so forth. We also want them to actively participate in advisory sessions. That's gonna give them an opportunity to potentially meet with their school counselor, engage in other conversations with their peers. It's just a, a huge component of that social emotional learning process. And we want them to utilize those Mondays to complete assignments, engage in flipped lessons, 
attend teacher office hours and tutoring sessions. So that's a brief checklist of days in the life of the student in a four by four schedule. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Delaney. And I think, you know, it's important to know that um, I, I think the schedule uh, will certainly be shared with families uh, soon and you'll have a better picture about how that time is, is spent. I also wanna reiterate what was shared uh, by Mrs. Colucci that the expectation is not that students spend that entire 75 minutes, minutes uh, directly connected to their uh, devices and that there will be interactive activities that are not uh, digital in nature. All right. So next we'll have a little conversation and take a sneak peek in what the life of a student with disability will look like in terms of their schedule as well as some of the activities that they may be involved in. So I've asked Dr. Ronnie myers Dobb, who is our Again, our executive director of the Office of Students um, with Disabilities, Special Education, Office of Programs for Exceptional Children. Um, Dr. myers Dobb. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Um, I just wanted to recap a little bit of what had been discussed in a previous and previous sessions that students with disabilities will be receiving their services during the virtual instruction and that IEP meetings will be held to discuss the parent instructional option that they selected for their student. The students will receive explicit instruction with clear expectations and practice to help give them the support that they need during that virtual instruction to address their unique needs and to ensure they have access to the general curriculum as well as um, promoting progress on IEP goals. They will also have the opportunity to receive instructional materials as well as assistive technology tools that they are required to have according to their IEP for use at home to support them during learning. Next slide, Dr. Rogers. So I wanted to spend more time talking about the schedule. This is a schedule for um, a student with a disability at the middle school level. And um, I just, I know Doc, Mr. Delaney just shared the four by four schedule at the middle school. So I just wanted to walk through what that typical day would be for a student with a disability that receives special education services in both the general and special education setting. So during um, the SEL advisory time, the student would have the opportunity to check in with the case manager. The case manager could review the student's um, schedule for the day, possibly provide them, um, him a visual schedule for the student to post on his device. They could review the task list from the previous day, um, look at what may not have been finished, prioritize those remaining, ta remaining tasks, and then set the learning expectations for the rest of the day providing any reminders or possible assistance with any struggles that the student could um, have experienced the day before. The next block would be the student's English block. The student would participate in the whole group lesson in the virtual general education setting. And when the students are, have the opportunity to work in small groups, at that time, the student would be assigned to a breakout room for small group instruction with a special education teacher and two peers in a virtual special education setting. And at this time, the student would receive instruction and support on organizing writing content. So the next block would be the student's science block. And at this time, the student would participate in learning activities and science and any of the required embedded ac um, accommodations would be embedded within those learning activities. At this time, the student could also be assigned to a breakout room with a group of peers to receive any support that they might need for um, from a teacher assistant. So then they would have their uh, stu the student would have the lunch break. They would attend their virtual elective for third block. And then the last block of the day, as Mr. Delaney shared um, previously, would be an opportunity for students, such as students with disabilities, to receive that academic um, and support and enrichment time. This time, a student could participate in a socials group activity with a few peers facilitated by the special education teacher. The student could work with the special education teacher on specific reading skills, such as identifying main idea and summarizing details. And then they would end that synchronous session by conferencing with the case manager to identify the assignments or activities that the student would need to complete in preparation for the next day. 
And again, this just highlights more of the synchronous time. Obviously, there would be asynchronous instruction embedded in between this and movement and breaks would be provided for this student as, as needed to be successful during the virtual day. Okay, Dr. Rogers, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ronnie myers Dobb. I appreciate it. And I did want to reiterate for family, sometimes we use a lot of edge of speak and I want to just be clear, synchronous and asynchronous, sometimes we confuse the two. Synchronous learning activities are very much what we're participating in right now. It's just in time, it's in the now, and you have an opportunity to interact live either through video conferencing or chatting, sending messages or perhaps talking on the telephone, but that's the live interaction that we are planning for our students. And again, that's what's significantly different from the emergency learning plan that took place in the spring. We didn't have very many opportunities, if at all, to participate in synchronous learning such as this. And Dr. Myers Dobb did mention that there will also be asynchronous learning opportunities. And that's an opportunity where you have a chance to go and retrieve a video. You may be able to watch the video, perhaps it's 10 or 15 minutes, and then you have an activity that is associated with that video. So those are the two differences between synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. So now we'll transition into a topic or area that we've gotten quite a few questions about. Of course, they those questions have diminished because we continue to provide opportunities such as this to answer questions as it relates to our K-12 programs. That's our, our resources, our art, music, PE, and uh, things of that nature, as well as with our gifted students and how we're providing opportunities for our English language learners. So I've asked Dr. DeVries to come and share just a little bit about what the snapshot in the life of a student that falls in one of these categories would look like. So Dr. DeVries. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us. You can switch over to the next slide for me. So as Ms. Colucci and Mr. Delaney have uh, mentioned several different times, we want to make sure that we are reaching all of our learners. Um, and uh, Dr. Myers Dobb spoke specifically to students with disabilities. But we are also very purposefully planning for our English language learners as well. So all students who are English uh, learners will begin instruction virtually. And then when we, that shift turns to the yellow phase, um, any option two student will become part of the virtual learning center. For option one students during that phase, our K-5 students will shift to in-person instruction at their home schools, and they will have instruction just like they always have. Their ESL teacher will push into their classrooms. They will um, support their students through direct instruction while they are um, included in the general ed education setting. They will also have opportunities to pull their students out into small group instruction as needed to reinforce some of those, um, some of the academic language as well as the social language. When sixth graders shift to um, in-person learning, the same thing will occur. Sixth graders at the middle school level and high school level have particular specific resource bells for ESL and they will engage in, with their ESL teacher and their peers during those uh, ESL resource bells. Seventh and eighth grade students will remain virtual through their home schools, but again, they will have um, interaction with their ESL teacher who will provide direct instruction virtually through um, by pushing in through synchronous and asynchronous learning. And our high school students are, are, are similar. So virtual instruction, what can you expect if you're an English learner? Well, as I said before, first of all, small group and synchronous instruction to focus on language development is going to be essential um, to A, uh, account for some of the gaps in, in, um, in understanding and mastery that may have occurred over the summer or over the spring, and B, just to focus on that um, academic language as well as social language to be able to, um, it's so important that English language learners are able to interact with their peers. So that synchronous instruction that didn't necessarily occur over the um, emergency learning plan is going to be so very important as we head into the fall. If you could switch the slide, please. So I'd like to shift now to our gifted learners. Again, another group um, of students that we need to really um, focus on and will receive some specialized instruction. So in grades two through 10, any identified gifted students will, as they always have been, be clustered in all phases and in both options. 
So if students are um, identified cluster and they're, they've chosen option one for face-to-face, -face, when they go back to face-to-face -face instruction, the gifted resource teacher will push into those classrooms to provide that differentiated instruction for gifted learners. They will also have some opportunities during uh, parts of the schedule that Ms. Colucci had talked about and, and um, Mr. Delaney had talked about where there are some opportunities for academic support and enrichment or some of those advisory blocks where the GRT will have an opportunity to pull um, some, some of the identified gifted learners into small group instruction to provide them some enrichment. For ODS students, all academic students in grades three through eight will receive instruction from an ODS teacher while they're all virtual. When we make that shift to the yellow phase, option two students will receive as much instruction as possible from ODS teachers. Um, Dr. Hendrick and her administrative team are diligently working on a plan to be able to meet all their learners' needs. When it's not possible, and if it's not possible, students will, of course, be supported by a designated GRT and receive their differentiated instruction um, through that GRT. Next slide, please. So we do have those identified gifted learners in the areas of art and dance. Um, our gifted visual arts program, which is a push, um, a pullout program for grades three through five where students attend weekly at ODS from their home schools and also our gifted dance education program which is the same model for grades three through eight students. Um, this program will continue throughout the 2020-2021 school year uh, through synchronous instruction. So all instruction for these programs will be online um, in a synchronous setting uh, throughout the school year and it, instruction will occur on Mondays. Students will also have asynchronous learning act, uh, opportunities where they're able to practice their skills on their own. And parents should receive a program um, schedule from Old Donation School in the next couple weeks uh, regarding what that schedule will look like specific to their child. Attendance and grading for both programs will resume this year. Um, and if your child was selected to audition for um, the gifted visual arts or the dance program. Uh, that did not occur in the spring, but once it's safe to do so and come back face to face in a safe way, um, they will resume those auditions. So those uh, parents should have been communicated to directly about that and we will continue to um, communicate that, that information out as we um, get it. Next slide, please. And of course, then we have our, our elective our art, music, physical education. Um, at the secondary level, we've got a whole bunch of electives, but focusing specifically on art, music, and physical education, as Ms. Kalushi has stated at the elementary level, there are times built into those schedules within the school day for students to participate in both synchronous and asynchronous uh, instruction in all of those areas, including strings. So if you're a fifth grade uh, parent of a fifth grade student, you can expect that if they are, um, signed up for strings instruction, that will be incorporated into their schedule as well um, through both synchronous and asynchronous opportunities. Any secondary student taking art, music as electives and PE classes, they will have those uh, electives as part of their four by four schedule. As Mr. Delaney mentioned that there will be um, at the middle school level, let's say the two core classes and then an elective class. So if they're taking art, um, they will take that class throughout the semester. Music curriculum, so how do we get all this in? Um, has been a question that's been asked frequently. Um, how are we going to teach music uh, virtually? So music curriculum has had a bit of a shift and it's, it's shifting focus from the musician as part of an ensemble to the, to the musician as a soloist. And so the curriculum and the instructional delivery model, um, while we're virtual and throughout the school year, We'll really focus on that um, students as a soloist, their ability to practice individually, to reflect, um, and to uh, hone their skills as a soloist musician. PE will shift from um, shifting their curriculum a bit to more, to focus on more low impact and low respiratory activities. And this is in preparation for when we come back face to face, um, that we wanna make sure that we're you know, using those um, health mitigations and, and part of that would be that any activity that's done that's physical in nature would be low respiratory um, to reduce the, um, 
the chance of um, spreading the virus. So when also when shifting to face-to-face uh, -face instruction, uh, there will not be any dressing out for PE at the secondary levels. Locker rooms will not be utilized, so that will be a bit of a shift, and also the PE curriculum has had to shift to take that into consideration. We know that art uh, and music materials are shared often in the art and music classroom between students, and so when we come back face-to-face, -face, we are going to make sure that that is minimized. Um, again, that has been a shift in the curriculum overall to make sure that the activities and learning opportunities that are presented to students, that students are able to use their own materials um, or that if they're shared, it's, it's minimized in nature. Um, and that, of course, uh, those materials will be cleaned between. During virtual instruction, students um, will be using for art and music materials that they have handy. Um, teachers understand that they have to kind of pivot a little bit and shift and and make do, and that's exactly what they're prepared to do um, within their lessons. And so um, we're just excited that we get to incorporate art, music, and PE into the schedule for students this year um, as part of their um, schedules, because it's so, so, it's so very important, especially with um, in the age of technology, that they'll actually be doing some really strong hands-on activities throughout not only their core classes, but also their elective classes. And you can sh shift that slide. Thank you, my mic. Thank you, Dr. DeVries. I appreciate it. I did want to share that the elementary schools will be sharing uh, schedules with a little more detail in terms of times so that you should be able to determine when your uh, student has morning meetings, when they'll have the instructional windows. It'll give you a better picture about what the specific school schedules are like. So please look for that to come from your elementary school principal uh, this week, at some point this week. Well, it's already Thursday, so it'll either be this evening or tomorrow. Uh, absolutely. I also wanted to point out as we transition into talking about instructional technology, well, how is all this going to happen? Virginia Beach has been fortunate in that we have a learning management uh, platform, a learning management system called Schoology. Many of you all who are not new to Virginia Beach uh, certainly know what that is and how we use that to leverage instruction in a, in a manner that uh, lends itself very nicely to teaching in a virtual environment. So I've asked Dr. Sharon Schubert to come and share a little bit about what that is going to look like and some of the resources that we have already had available and some of the new resources that we have to make life a little easier for our students and our families. So Dr. Shoebridge, I'll turn this over to you. Thanks. So good evening, everybody. I'm so excited to be last because I got to ring and you know bring us all in. Um, if we were practicing excellent instructional practice, we would take a break right now so that you all could run around and get up from your device because you've just gotten 40 minutes of a lot of information. Um, what I'm going to try to provide for you are just the informational pieces about how this is going to work for your students um, when they are participating in virtual instruction. So um, one of the pieces uh, we just wanted to share is that all students will have a school issued device. So if your child was in Virginia Beach City Public Schools last year, they currently have a device or there may have there may be a device for them at their home school. They're going to hang on to the device they left in the spring with. Okay, so you don't have to turn it back in and get a new device. We're going to let the students carry on with the Chromebook that they have. For new students to Virginia Beach, including kindergartners, they will be issued a Chromebook from their home school. It just might take a little while for us to shift devices around to make sure if we have um, a larger number of enrollments at one school, we're just going to shift devices. But all students will have access to a Chromebook. Our pre-K students will be issued an iPad. And again, the Department of Technology is working to shift devices around the division to make sure we have the right number in every building. And just for clarification, I'm instructional technology. I do a lot of work with the Department of Technology, but we're two different um, groups. Um, the other piece that I'm sharing on behalf of the Department of Technology is that if you don't have in, um, Wi-Fi service or a stable internet, um, please reach out to your school's principal or office team to find out how you can seek information about securing Wi-Fi through the school division. So there is a help desk number, but also your first and best bet is to contact your school's administrative team 
or the office staff and they can point you in the right direction of how to inquire about securing Wi-Fi or internet access. Next slide, please. As Dr. Rogers shared, the learning management system we've had in Virginia Beach for the last five years is called Schoology, and we use it K through 12 to organize curriculum, deliver instructional material, and receive assignments back from students. Um, in the past several years, it's been um, used for um, not as consistently as we did starting in, in when we closed schools because it had there had to, when you're face to face it's a lot easier to deliver instruction to your students it's a lot easier to pass out and receive information back when we went to the remote learning and the continuity of learning and emergency learning plan schoology became a critical resource um, that we had had for five years so we just really put it into into practice Based on feedback from parents, from teachers and students in the spring, um, we realized we needed to have some structure and some continuity across all courses in Schoology. So we have developed um, an organizational chart that all teachers will use grades K through 12 on how to set up their Schoology course. So whether you have a child in second grade, fifth grade and seventh grade, their course structure should look similar. So it'll help you as a parent it will help the students be able to find their resources and materials. Once students are rostered at their school, so once their schedules are created, their Schoology courses are automatically populated for them. So once they log into Schoology, they'll see all of their courses. Um, so you as a parent will be able to help them navigate if they are starting with um, English for first block, you'll be able to help them navigate to that course. Next slide, please. So one of the additions that we have this year um, is we have a new internet filtering system. We had one previously, but we have a new company this year and it's called Securely. Um, it will filter what's happening on the child's Chromebook at school, as well as what's happening on the division Chromebook at home. This is gonna be helpful when the teacher is doing instruction. Um, it will be helpful when a parent has a question about what their child is working on on the computer, we can get reports and data from Securely um, on the school issued Chromebook. There is a way for parents to go in and set up the um, filtering as well. Can you go to the next slide please, Dr. Rogers? So I went in and this is a sample of my parent view. So I have two students in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. I can see both of their accounts. And as a parent, I can change settings. So if my children are home, I can change settings of things I don't want them to be able to access. Um, for example, some YouTubes are not blocked by the school division, but if you as a parent wanted to block YouTube, you can do that through filtering at home. Next slide, please. The other benefit from Securely is going to, is a product called Securely Classroom, and you can go to the next slide, Dr. Rogers. Securely Classroom is going to be the way that the classroom teacher um, is going to be able to monitor what's happening um, with the student devices while the teacher is instructing. So it will give the teacher, um, if you see, if you look to the left side, that's a teacher's dashboard, and the teacher can see um, all of the students' Chromebooks and what they have open on their Chromebook. So if a teacher has assigned students to go to a specific website, they can see that, you know, six out of the, five out of the six students went to the site she asked them to, but this one student happens to be playing Minecraft. The teacher can send a note to the student to say, can you please close Minecraft and get to this website? The, student, the teacher can um, send a message. If you look to the right, the top bar on the right, that's a chat. The teacher and student can chat. It is only teacher to student. It is not student to student but the teacher can send a note to the student to say, we're working on Achieve 3000, or you should be in IXL, or you should be on this website. Um, and then the student also has the ability to raise a hand to let the teacher know that they have a question or they need some support. Um, we think that this will be helpful for teachers to keep students focused and engaged in the work that they're assigning while the students are synchronous with the teacher. And again, this part is monitored during synchronous instruction, face-to-face -face instruction at school or synchronous instruction at home. Next slide, please, Dr. Rogers. Another product that we are securing for this school year, again, very much based on parent, teacher, student feedback is a product called ClassLink. Can you just go to the next slide? Um, ClassLink is a single sign-on platform that's going to allow students and staff to safely and securely access all of their digital resources with a single username and password. So previously, you would have had to log into the device 
you would have had to log into the school's um, Schoology page, you would have had to log into Clever. There would have been multiple logins. With ClassLink, there's only one login, and it will get you to the secure site. This used to be, um, we had a product last year called Clever. So this is a replacement for Clever. Um, ClassLink does not collect or share any personal information and it's easy to use. Um, and as we roll out schedules over the next several weeks, you'll see additional information um, loaded into your child's ClassLink launch page. Um, this dashboard, as you can see, if you look at it, it looks a little bit like your cell phone maybe. Um, the, we liked the ease of use of this, that students could create folders and they could slide specific apps that they use all the time into the folder. Um, as you can see, there's a textbook folder. That textbook folder will be populated with those textbooks that belong to your students. So if you have a third grader, any third grade textbook will be already populated in that folder for your child. If you have a 10th grader who's taking multiple courses, um, you know, Latin two, um, math analysis, biology, whatever, all of the textbooks associated with those will also be in that folder for the student. It'll be ready to go. Can you go to the next slide for me? which might be a duplicate. But as you can see on this one, there's the Schoology app. Um, again, we will train our students on specific things that they can add that will help them out. If you look on along the, oh, it doesn't show it. Okay, can you go to the next slide for me, Dr. Rogers? One of the benefits of ClassLink is also a product, a part of it called the backpack. Um, and the screen before didn't have it because that's, um, I have a different, view level than teachers and students, but there's an icon that'll be at the bottom of the screen that looks just like a backpack. And the beauty of the backpack is child can open up their backpack and as you can see inside the backpack you can see all of their courses and all of the applications that are associated with that course. So instead of having to go to multiple locations, the student can open up their backpack and see that they have Brain Pop maybe is assigned to them, or Redbird, which is a math product, is assigned to them. And instead of having to go into Clever and searching for something, it's already assigned to them and aligned to their um, coursework. Again, we're trying to make it easier for students and, pam and parents and guardians and babysitters, whoever's helping children at home, to be able to find the products based on what the assignment is from the classroom teacher. The one thing I want to share about the backpack is that as we are rostering students, um, applications will appear. So not everything might be there on September 8th, but by September 10th, there could be two additional applications. By the next week, there could be one more application. It is going to take, as we roster our students and get them in the right course where they're supposed to be, you may see some icons come and go from this page. However, once we're rolling into the school year, the students will have access to those applications. Next slide, please. So a question that we have received a lot is how are we making sure we have provided enough professional development for our teachers? And that is a great question. Um, you know, I wish I could have teachers time all the time just to just little tips and tricks. On Tuesday of this week, our instructional technology specialist, every building has an instructional technology specialist. Um, put on a conference for teachers called the Digital Learning Summer Summit. We had over 1,400 teachers registered and attending, um, and it was a powerful um, converse, conference for teacher sharing ideas with teachers. We, in the spring, developed a website full of all of our resources, um, and we have continued that same um, process this fall. We just shifted it to a, a page called Instructional Technology. But as you can see on this website, um, we have drop downs for resources, we have drop downs for Virtual Learning 101, um, and then links to all of the videos from the DLSS conference we had on Tuesday. Um, it's just a way for teachers to seek information about something they're going to try. So if they were going to use Google Meet as their conferencing tool, there is a whole bunch of resources under Virtual Learning 101 about how to utilize Google Meet for their virtual conferences. If they were going to use um, Loom to create an asynchronous or on-demand um, lesson for students, there's directions for how they can set that up. Um, next slide, please, Dr. Rogers. And as you can see, this is just an example. So this is the course that was run this summer and it's just, these are all the teachers participating in 
um, a Zoom training. And as you, this is very much what um, it can look like for your student when they're participating in a morning meeting or a greeting with their teacher. All of the students are on the screen. They can see one another and interact, and interact with one another. Next slide, please, Dr. Rogers. Um, and the last piece I'm gonna share is that we are continuing professional development um, and we will continue it throughout the fall. Every opportunity we can to get in front of teachers to give them new strategies or, or tricks or tips that'll make it easier or more functional for them and their students. Right now we are focusing on a section um, part one, um, the social emotional piece for students and how do you build that relationship with students across the computer? Um, how do you get ready? What are some things you should be thinking about as you're getting ready to start the school year, as well as the most effective digital tools. And in the month of September, we will do a second part focusing on engagement boosters. How do you provide effective feedback to teachers? How do you provide effective feedback to students from the assignments and the work that they've shared with you? Um, and then to also share ideas. What have you learned in the first two weeks of virtual instruction that you wanna share with your colleagues? And I know that was an awful lot of information, um, but we are doing our very best to provide support to the schools um, through the instructional technology specialist and the library media specialist. Dr. Rogers, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you all very much for participating in this discussion. We don't have a lot of time left for questions, and I was monitoring the questions that were sent in ahead of time, and most of them have been answered. So I wanted to provide a little bit of opportunity to answer some of the questions that I feel that we can expand on a little bit. And the first one, Dr. Shoebridge, since you just left, I'll pose this one to you, and it says, is there a way I can track my child's progress to see if he is turning in assignments or not? Yes, actually there's two ways. So um, we have been requesting all parents to join Parent View. Um, and if you have signed up for a Parent View account, you can see your child's, um, your, you can see your child's name and it has all of their schedules, their, their grade book, et cetera. So within Parent View, you have an ability to see if your child has turned in, miss, or has turned in work or has any missing assignments. But you can also go into Schoology um, off of our Virginia Beach City Public Schools website. There's a Schoology support page. And on the Schoology support page, there's a specific section about parent navigation and how parents can navigate. And one of those pieces talks about how as a parent you can view their um, gradebook, their assignments, and see what is still missing and what has been turned in. So you could use either Parent View or Schoology to track how your students are doing as far as whether or not they're turning in their work. And in Schoology, you can even set a notification. So when your child does submit something, you can be notified. So there's directions on our Virginia Beach City Public Schools website with that information. That's a great feature. So I'm looking at this next question. It's about kindergartners. So Dr. Mrs. Colucci, this one is gonna be, I'll throw this one to you. And it says, and I agree, starting school is hard enough for many students and the transition into kindergarten can be tough for many families too. How are the new kindergarten students going to be brought into this virtual environment? Uh, thank you, Dr. Rogers. Actually, I experienced this firsthand. Uh, my daughter was in kindergarten last year. And so although at least she had already um, been in the classroom with her peers, um, she had moved. So she'd only been there a couple of weeks. Um, and the kindergarten teachers and teacher assistants were amazing. They modeled strategies. They focused on getting used to the new platforms, uh, team building, and all of those important social skills that our, our um, students need. The same went for pre-K. Um, our teachers will get a lot of that professional learning that Dr. Shoebridge just support, uh, shared with everyone as well. And I think that will make the practice and experience that our teachers had already um, in marking period four of last school year even stronger. And so we will be focusing on social emotional learning, um, learning our routines and procedures, how do you raise your hand virtually, how to share with a partner in a break room. And so, all of that will um, slowly um, be taught to our littlest learners. Okay, thank you very much. So the other questions that I have are very similar to the questions that we've already answered and 
shared information on one that we didn't touch on that I want to ask both you and Mr. Delaney and it is uh, what supplies will online only students need for the upcoming school year and that's a question I know it's two weeks into the uh, till we start and parents want to know what should they be buying so students they'll all need the, an, an assigned device their school assigned device um, but just as in a regular school year, uh, schools are working to share those school supply lists and they've enhanced them. Some of the enhancements are based on the Department of Teach and Learning recommendations that curriculum and content and instructional technology specialists have made. Uh, and then some arrangements are being made at the school level as well um, for processes of picking up materials and following health mitigations and protocols for that. So we're working our way through that to ensure all of our students' needs are met and they have what they need to be successful. Okay. Mr. Laney, you have anything briefly to add? If not, that's fine. No, I think Ms. Colucci covered it. Other than we, we certainly understand the, the dilemma that is posed in starting the school year virtually and what is needed for a child to be successful in that course. And we're going to continue to investigate as many ways as possible to ensure that they have those materials and we can provide that support. It's going to be a coordinated effort between the schools and central office staff, but we, we certainly understand the dilemma that is posed when you don't have a traditional start to the school year. Well, thank you all very much, and I do appreciate your time, and thank you for all of our families and colleagues who've joined us. Just to share some more information about how we're planning for the upcoming school year, and I know we can never replace the brick and mortar schoolhouse, but we are sure working extremely hard to try to make sure that we bridge the gap between brick and mortar and learning in the cloud, if you will. So I do appreciate that. I do want to remind our families that although we didn't speak specifically to it, but we are absolutely providing support for our students who participate in the ATC and in AVID and all those other programs that we have access to for our students. And I do want to remind you that if you have additional questions to please visit our FAQs on our websites. We also have the fall 2020 plan that was posted um, last month and we just recently submitted our instructional plan to the state that was approved uh, earlier this week and I encourage you to visit our website for that and I also want to invite you to join us next Thursday for the fourth series entitled being safe in and outside of the classroom where our chief operations officer will walk us through what it will look like in our schoolhouses so with that being said thank you all very much and good night <laughs>